the other, so just feel free to pick it up as you uh, as you <coughs> um, As you all know, Operation Pedro Pan um, is one of the most dramatic episodes of the Cuban exodus to the United States. Between December 1960 and October 1962, 14,048 unaccompanied Cuban children came to Miami through a program organized by the Catholic Church. It was the largest recorded exodus of unaccompanied children in the Western Hemisphere. Oh, about half of the children were scattered uh, in long-term foster care or orphanages in 35 different U.S. states. I'll leave the explanation of the causes and the consequences of this unique migration experience to our guest speaker. But in any case, I also wanted to mention that several former Pedro Pans are now well-known members of the community, including, of course, uh, former U.S. Senator Mel Martinez, singer Willy Chirino, and Lisette Alvarez, businessman Carlos Saladigas, writer Carlos Eide, and artist Ana Mendieta. Uh, so this is a topic that we uh, are going to hear about today. I'm very pleased to introduce Eloisa Echazaba, herself a Pedro Pan. She arrived from Cuba with her youngest sister on September 6, 1961, and she tells the Nuevo Hero via Operation Pedro Pan. Uh, she and her sister were sent to the Immaculate Heart of Mary Home, an orphanage in Buffalo, New York, which I'm sure she can talk to us about. They were both reunited with her parents nine months afterwards. Currently, she's the assistant to the medical campus president at uh, Miami Dade College. She holds a master's in finance and economics from Seattle University and a bachelor's degree from FIU in international relations. She's a founding member and formerly board member of Operation Pedro Pan Group. She's worked with a Pedro Pan colleague, Carmen Romagnac, to create a living history of people who work with the program and care for the children. And these interviews can be found here at FIU. Uh, in the special collections and university archives, as well as other educational institutions, including the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian. So please help us <coughs> give a warm welcome to Luis Sánchez Alves. Well, thank you very much for to all of you I'm for being here, here this afternoon. Yeah, good. And a um, um, special thank you to Florida International University, to Dr. Duani, uh, for allowing me this opportunity to tell you about the Pedro Pan Exodus experience. Uh, I wish I could introduce all of you here, uh, all the important people, but there's another one more person that I would like to specifically introduce now, and that's uh, the Dean of the FIU Libraries, Dean Anne Prestamo. And she's here with her husband, Manuel, and I appreciate her being here, Dean Prestamo. Thank you. to show you a 20 minute video that outlines, first of all, the reasons why, the, the things that were happening in Cuba that caused the parents to make the decision that they did uh, at that time. Then uh, it, the video shows how the Pedro Pan Exodus was created and how it was administered. After that, I'd like to tell you about my specific story. And then after that, uh, during the question and answer period, I would like the Pedro Pans in the audience to help me with the discussion uh, session. So right now, the video. Yeah. 
Castro took power in Cuba on January 1, 1959. He was the leader of one of the movements against the Batista government. Cubans were jubilant and hopeful that stability and free elections would finally return to their country. But soon the new revolutionary government began to transform into an authoritarian and totalitarian regime. Individual liberties were abolished. Incarcerations and summary executions for, poli for political reasons took place without due process, just for suspicion of counter-revolutionary activities. And free elections never took place. Committees for the defense of the revolution were established on each block by the government. These committees expected citizens to report to the government on the daily lives and anti-revolutionary activities and feelings of neighbors, colleagues, friends, and family members. Even suspicion of anti-revolutionary feelings and activities resulted in harassment and could land people in jail. Following are other examples of human rights violations which were a sure sign of the type of authoritarian and totalitarian government which was taking hold of the island. <coughs> All independent news media, such as newspapers, television, and radio stations, were slowly taken over and became under government control. The National Institute of Agrarian Reform was established, which expropriated a large number of private land holdings. The government expropriated land holdings of a certain size and distributed them to farmers who then had control of production but not of ownership. The urban reform law nationalized all privately owned residential rental real estate. Therefore, all privately held rental property became part of the communist state. Cuban currency was changed. Cubans with a bank account could change only up to 10,000 pesos and take out only 100 pesos per month. Anyone without a bank account could change only 200 pesos. This affected inheritances and savings people had for things such as their children's future and retirement. Privately owned Cuban and foreign companies of all sizes were taken over by the government. Cubans were prohibited from freely traveling abroad unless they had written permission from the government. Many Cubans were made to relinquish all possessions, including their homes, in exchange for permission to leave. Also, special permission was required to return to the island, so if you left, you could not return freely. Public religious services were banned. For example, in September 1961, the traditional religious procession to celebrate the Day of Our Lady of Charity was interrupted by the government with violence. Government seized all private schools and intensified Marxist indoctrination. A new education reform law was established stating that education is the responsibility of the revolutionary government, a responsibility it must not delegate nor transfer. Therefore, the communist government assumed sole responsibility for the education of the youth. Schools closed for eight months so the government could restructure its new education system and implement its new education reform law. During this time, the government also created the literacy campaign and established alphabetization journeys to teach reading and writing to peasants and others. Youths were encouraged to join, which took them away from their families, often without adequate supervision, for long period, periods of time. La Cartilla was the teaching manual used in the literacy campaign. La Cartilla was used not only to teach reading and writing, but also to teach the students and the youths teaching them the new revolutionary government politics and the new revolutionary way of thinking. Groups of youths were also sent to the communist bloc countries for long periods of study and indoctrination in the communist ideology. The United States Catholic newspaper The Voice reported in January 1961 that Cuba and the Soviet Union exchanged a thousand youngsters to work and learn on each other's farms. Many of these children, in their early teens or younger, would not 
organizations were established by the government through the schools. In addition to training the youth on the new revolutionary government way of thinking, in these organizations, youths were expected to spy and report on their parents' daily lives and on their parents' anti-revolutionary feelings and activities. Some organizations even trained youth to operate rapid-fire automatic guns, supposedly to defend the country from enemy attack. <coughs> it should be noted that while activities and initiatives such as the youth paramilitary organizations, the alphabetization journey is far away from home, and the long educational indoctrination assignments in the Soviet Union were not mandatory at the time. Parents not in favor of their children's participation in them were seen as uncooperative with the new revolutionary government, which placed, placed them in an unfavorable situation, which many times included harassment. Parents begin to look for ways to take the children out of Cuba until the children could safely return to Cuba once the communist dictatorship was toppled because most parents did not believe the communist government would last in power long or until the parents could reunite with their children in the United States. Many parents adopted a wait-and-see attitude before beginning the plans to leave the island. Operation Pedro Pan is born. James Baker was the headmaster of Roston Academy, an American private school in Havana. Parents in Cuba came to him for assistance in taking their children out of the island away from the repressive government. Father Brian O. Walsh was the director of the Catholic Welfare Bureau in Miami. He realized that among all Cubans arriving in Miami fleeing the repressive government, came children unaccompanied without their parents. The plan in action. Baker and Walsh met in Miami in early December 1960. The plan was that Baker in Cuba would send Walsh in Miami through embassy pouches the names of children whose parents wished to take them out of Cuba unaccompanied to escape repression and indoctrination. Walsh would obtain the required student visas and would send them to Baker in Cuba through embassy pouches. He also secured places in Miami for the children who had no relatives or friends in the United States. Walsh also obtained approval from the United States government to use federal funds for the care of Cuban unaccompanied minors. On December 26, 1960, the first Pedro Pan children traveled alone to the United States using student visas. The number of unaccompanied children begins as a trickle. Half of the children were met in Miami and stayed with relatives or friends. Children who had no one in the United States were placed in group homes and other facilities managed by the Catholic Welfare Bureau led by Father Walsh. And here you see two of the first group homes. <coughs> End of the plan. On January 3rd, 1961, United States-Cuba diplomatic relations were severed. Therefore, the United States Embassy stopped issuing visas. With no more U.S. visas being issued, it seemed that the unaccompanied children exodus would be coming to an end. In one of his later interviews, Father Walsh said that when this occurred, he thought to himself, well, at least we tried. In early January 1961, James Baker joined Father Walsh in Miami to help find a new solution for the problem of the Cuban children. Initial solution, to send the children to the United States via Jamaica. The British authorities in Kingston were willing to grant student visas to those entering under the Baker-Walsh plan. The children would then be given visas to travel to the United States from Jamaica. The Catholic Bishop of Kingston secured lodging for the short stay required before traveling to the United States. <coughs> In mid-January 1961, the United States State Department invited Father Walsh to a meeting in Washington to discuss a new solution for the problem of the unaccompanied Cuban children. At this meeting, the United States
United States State Department authorized the Catholic Welfare Bureau in Miami to issue visa waivers to children in Cuba. Here is a photo of Father Walsh and Abraham Rivikoff, the United States Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare in early 1961. Here are samples of visa waivers. Visa waivers allow the children to leave Cuba for the United States without a visa. A steady stream of children continues arriving in Miami. <coughs> children were met at the Miami airport by George Warch, a Catholic welfare employee who made sure the children were well taken care of and took them through the immigration process. Then he would take to the camps or group homes those who had no family or friends meeting them at the airport. <coughs> During the first few months of the exodus, Mr. James Baker and other volunteers also took care of the children at the airport and transported them to the camps and group homes. <coughs> Mr. Baker was also one of the first house parents of the unaccompanied Cuban Children's Program. During the Bay of Pigs invasion, Castro mobilized all available forces. Men as young as 14 and 15 years old were deployed in the battle zone. The failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion increased government, government repression and fears of losing the children to the go communist government. That is when Operation Pedro Pan really kicked up into high gear. Priests and nuns were forced to leave Cuba. Visa waiver distribution continues throughout the island at a faster pace and the children's exodus goes into overdrive. In December 1961, Fidel Castro indicates that for many years he had been a Marxist-Leninist and would be for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, there was a large underground movement inside Cuba to get the children out. Visa waiver distribution continues throughout the island at a faster pace and a large group of courageous people inside the island distributed the visa waivers. And here are the names and photos of some of those courageous people. Now the children's exodus goes into overdrive. Children with no one in the United States were placed in group homes and camps managed by the Catholic Welfare Bureau in Miami, led by Father Walsh. Following are photos of children in those camps and group homes. Here's the Jesuit boys' residence. Here is St. Raphael's Hall. Here is Kendall Camp. Here is Florida City Camp. Matecumbe Camp. Opalaka Camp. Whitehall Group Home. Because the number of children arriving daily in Miami was very large, group homes and other shelters reached over capacity. Therefore, licensed care facilities such as group homes, orphanages, boarding schools, and foster homes in over 100 cities in over 35 states were made available. Then the children began to be transferred to these places all over the United States, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. One of the results of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 was that flights between Cuba and the United States stopped. And this ended not only the exodus of unaccompanied children in the United States, but the parents of those children already in the United States were not able to travel to reunite with their children. Some were able to leave it through third countries, but not many were able to do this. Needless to say, the hopes of reunification <coughs> of parents and children was devastating. By this time, 14,048 children had left Cuba for the United States without their parents. Of those, 6,496 received foster care upon arrival or shortly thereafter. Separation of many parents and children lasted about three years until Cuba and the United States reached an agreement to create the Freedom Flights in December 1965. 
parents of unaccompanied children in the United States were given first priority, and within six months, most parents were able to reunite with their children in the United States. However, many parents were unable to leave it for different reasons, such as Cuban government refusal to release them, loyalty to their own aged parents, political imprisonment of other family members, or military service of other children. Who were the Pedro Pan children? They came from all races and classes of society, but the majority were the children of middle class families, most of them attending private schools in Cuba. Most were between the ages of 12 and 16. 70% were boys over 12. Of the 14,048 children, most were Catholic, and there were 396 Jewish, 700 Protestant, and others with no religious affiliation. Funding for the program was made available by the federal government. The funds were distributed through various Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, and other agencies located in over 100 cities in over 35 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. Why the name Pedro Pan? The Miami News Media coined the term as an analogy of the Disney character Peter Pan, the boy who flew to Never Never Land. Gene Miller of the Miami Herald and Ralph Rennick of WTVJ Channel 4 were the first ones to use the term Operation Pedro Pan. Pedro Pan's no doubt had a rough time adjusting to the new culture, language, and being away from their families. However, they pulled through and flourished in their new country, thanks to the values inculcated in them by their parents. The values of family ties and traditions, love of country, the importance of obtaining an education, and a strong work ethic. This is also the story of the sacrifice the Cuban parents had to make by sending their children alone to a foreign country to save them from the horrors of the dictatorship in the making. They certainly had to take a leap of faith to save their children from the communist dictatorship which was taking, all, taking over the island. They are the true heroes of this story. Pedro Paz today are like brothers and sisters. We like to get together to reminisce, exchange stories about our Pedro Pan experiences, and to make new friends. Most Pedro Pan archives, documents, and memorabilia are kept in three places. The Perry University Archives, the University of Miami Library's Cuban Heritage Collection, and the Florida International University Special Collections Archives. These are some of the sources used for this presentation. And thank you for your interest in our Pedro Pan Exodus story. <coughs>
Um, I taught Sunday school uh, to the children of public schools, and uh, I took ballet and piano lessons. The typical life of a Cuban family in those days. This is my school. You know, every year at the end of the year, they give you, they have this big event where they give you the medals and the awards and all that. And here's me. I don't have too many photos, unfortunately, but I do have this one. And here's the nun. But um, as you know, May 1961, all private schools were intervened by the communist government and communist indoctrination was instituted in all those schools. In addition, communism was also being taught in all the, uh, the public schools. So actually, there was no school that our parents could send us to. Um, I was uh, in the school when it was intervened by the government. I remember vividly, <coughs> I was in the class, and I remember when the militia men came in, going in and out of the rooms as if that was their home, and the nuns, of course, the nuns knew what was going on in Cuba at the time, but this is something that you're never ready for. You're never prepared for something like this. They were really stunned. So we went home, and we were so upset with all our parents, we didn't want to go back to school. And even if we hadn't said that, our parents would not have sent us back to school. So uh, that was the last day we attended school in Cuba. We know all parents in Cuba lost the freedom to decide how their children were going to be educated and raised, because everything in all the schools was being taught by the government, you know, by the philosophy of the government. So I believe my parents made the decision, that decision to send us away that day uh, when the, our schools were, were taken over. Um, and so on September 6, 1961, my sister, my three little cousins who were in the same situation, and I boarded a Pan American flight bound for Miami from Havana. I can't tell you that I was sad. You know, I was excited. Uh, I was taking it as, as an adventure, mostly because our parents kept telling us that it was going to be for a short time. Of course, most people didn't think that the Castro government was going to last so long. So, you know, they told me that it was going to be for a few weeks, a few months. You know, you'll continue your education, you'll continue practicing your, your religion there, and then once the communist government was toppled, we could go back to Cuba and continue li uh, living our life. <coughs> Surprise. Okay, so I was told two things by my parents uh, before we left. First of all, of course, to take care of my little sister, who was eight, and my cousins. And then the second thing was when we arrived in Miami, we had to ask for a man named George. And that's George. George was an employee of Catholic Charities, of the uh, Catholic Welfare, Welfare Bureau. He made all the flights, and uh, he took care of the children at the airport, you know, through immigration process. He gave us candy, he gave us sandwiches, things like that. And then after all that was over at the airport, then he would take us in his van. Sometimes in, he had, a, he had a, another type of van, but mostly in this white van. He would take us to the uh, camps or group homes. So he took us to Kenda. He took my sister, my cousins, and I to the Kenda camp. Uh, life in the Kenda camp was fine. You know, it was just like in any summer camp. During the daytime, we had activities. We attended uh, English classes. Uh, so things were fine. Now it was at night when things were different. My sister and I uh, uh, slept in two separate dormitories because of our difference in ages. And it was at night when you heard the kids cry. It was at night when we missed our parents the most. It was at night when we missed our home. You know, I don't know why, but that's, that's the, the worst part. Then the, the day would come, and then again, back to the activities and to the classes. And days would go by, and you know how kids are, they adjust, uh, and we all made it. Now, um, after being in Kenda six days, uh, about seven days, we were told that they would be moving us, they would be sending us to Buffalo, New York. It was fine, because every day, we were used to that, every day you would hear, oh, so-and-so is uh, going to Nebraska. Oh, so-and-so is going to Texas. So that was part of the daily 
routine there in the camps. So they told us after seven days, which was soon, which was pretty fast, that we were going to be going to Buffalo. <coughs> so the day that um, the little bus came to take us to the airport, I remember the young, attractive guy who was taking us to the airport. He said to me, and where are you going? And remember, I didn't know any English at the time. So I said, Buffalo. <laughs> and he said, Buffalo, I don't want to el, el, el rubio con ojos azules. In English, everybody there has blonde and blue eyes. 